We really appreciate you coming out. I think this is going to be a very enjoyable uh, evening. I'd like to welcome you to the final event for the 2010 Morehouse King Celebration. We've had an entire month of wonderful activities, wonderful commemorative events that have really involved all sectors of the campus community. <coughs> and it's really fitting that we would end the month with this wonderful public conversation uh, that I think you'll enjoy. I want to say a little bit first, though, about the Morehouse College Martin Luther King Collection, uh, give you a little background about it. Many of you may know that Morehouse acquired the collection in 2006 and that it contains over 10,000 original items, uh, many of which are in Dr. King's own handwriting, such as sermons, speeches, drafts of sermons, correspondence, and over a thousand books that are, many of which are heavily annotated with Dr. King's writing and note taking in the margins. So this is a really valuable treasure uh, that the institution has acquired. Uh, shortly thereafter, after the institution received the collection, it established an office of the Morehouse College King Collection. And our responsibility in this office is to generate programming the kind of programming that you will see tonight around the collection. Programming with the collection as a, a focal point, as a centerpiece, so that we can generate interest in your going over there, uh, taking a look at uh, the series that are in the collection, using it uh, in your coursework, uh, as well as um, you know, an opportunity to read and learn more about Dr. King, the people involved in that social movement, um, and um, working for social change. So we're about uh, programming that hopefully will inspire you, uh, will inspire you to take up the teachings and the philosophy of Dr. King uh, and the movement for social change. I would like to now introduce our guest, and I should say straight away that our guests have remarkable, remarkable careers. So you've got biographical statements in your program. I'm going to refer you to those brief bios in your program, uh, and I'm just going to give some very brief introductions so we can move ahead this evening. First of all, uh, Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, who's on the far end over there, on my far end, Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook is former president of Dillard University in New Orleans, where he served for 22 years. He holds a PhD degree in political science and has uh, had a vast national influence in higher education in addition to his many contributions to human rights and social change. Dr. Cook was the first African-American professor to hold a regular faculty appointment at a predominantly white university in the South. That was Duke University. He was honored by that institution, and in 1997, he was appointed to its board of trustees as a trustee emeritus. Dr. Charles Burt Willey, who's closer to me here on this end of the uh, stage, is also a nationally recognized scholar and educator. He began his career as chair of the Department of Sociology at Syracuse University, and in 1974, he joined the faculty of Harvard University in the Graduate School of Education, where he has remained and is now Professor Emeritus. Dr. Willie's expertise is in the area of school desegregation. He has served as a consultant and expert witness in some of the nation's landmark civil rights cases. And like Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, Dr. Willie is the author of numerous books and publications. Finally, this evening's conversation will be led by Dr. Marcella Sparksdale, who's currently professor of history here at Morehouse College and the director of African American Studies. Dr. Sparksdale has been with the college for 33 years uh, and is a Morehouse graduate himself who went on to pursue a graduate degree, a PhD in, uh, in history. He is widely published, a member of Phi Beta Kappa, and was recently appointed by President Robert Franklin to steer the committee which will plan the 150th anniversary of the college uh, that the college will celebrate in 2017. These gentlemen were classmates of Dr. King's, uh, the class of 1948. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Barksdale for uh, the conversation. Thank you. Indeed, the 1940s is often referred to by many of us who are also graduates of the college as the greatest generation to matriculate at our beloved alma mater, Morehouse College. Uh, and of course, the class of 1948, which included these two gentlemen of great prominence and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., among many others, 
And I'm sure as the conversation unfolds, they will uh, tell you about some of their classmates and, and the successes that they have had. Often the class of 1948 is considered the greatest class to graduate from the college. It's often used as a kind of standard or kind of a barometer by which other classes are evaluated and, and rated. Uh, I was not a member of the class of 1948. <laughs> I was a member of the great class of 1965. However, it would have been a great joy and an honor to have been a member of the great class of 1948. Um, there are many of you who are about to graduate from the college. There are some in the audience who have graduated from the college. And I think we will all be inspired and emboldened by what the conversation will reveal. Now, I am merely the facilitator. We will hear uh, the remembrances and the stories of Morehouse from uh, Dr. Cook and uh, Dr. Willie, members of the class of, uh, of 1948. And I encourage you to read their biographical profiles in the program. Uh, their biographical profiles are much longer, and you may Google their names and get more information. I thought I would open the conversation by asking each of them, beginning with you, Dr. Cook, how did you come to Morehouse, and why did you so decide to matriculate here? Once again, why did you, or how did you come to Morehouse, or come to know about Morehouse, and why did you decide to matriculate at, at the college? I came, I'm from Griffin, Georgia, right down the road, about 35 miles. In those days, it was uh, actually about 40 miles. I suppose they built the expressway in 1941. In the 1940s, Morehouse used to send students to the tobacco farm to work during the summer to earn money to carry on their educational activities. I was lucky. While I was in high school, I had a brother who was at Morehouse, finished in 1942, and I got to know some people at Morehouse. So I went to the tobacco farm while I was in high school. In fact, a sophomore in high school. And I met all these wonderful, bright, gifted Mohawk students. Not only did I meet the Mohawk students, I met Dean Brazil, the legendary academic dean at Mohawk. But even more important, I met a man named Benjamin Elijah Mays, who, would, who came to the tobacco farm to uh, visit, to see what was going on, to check us out. And I shall never forget, Dr. Mays, out on the tobacco farm, picking tobacco. He's a great competitor. And I shall never forget the kind of suit he had on, and the way he carried himself. I was just so impressed. So after that summer of uh, being on the tobacco farm, working day and part of the night, and after meeting Dean Brazil, and above all, this man named Benjamin Elijah May, I just knew I had to become a Mohawk man. It was a matter of destiny. Mm -hmm. So when I finished high school in Griffin, Georgia, I applied to one school, Mohawk College. Mm -hmm. And it never occurred to me until I came back for my 30th reunion. What would have happened and Mohawk turned me down. I applied to one school. What would have happened? What would have been my destiny? First, I think destiny itself would have been disappointed. <laughs> I knew I would. So this, the experience I had, the encounter I had, with Mohawk students on the tobacco farm, with Dean Brazil, and above all was Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. He's been one of the great lights of my life, and it added meaning to my life. That's how I got to Moaz College. 
and one of the greatest joys and achievements of my life to be a Moab man. Well, we're very pleased that uh, Mohawks did accept you and uh, the contributions you've made to the world, <laughs> and certainly to me as my mentor. Before we go to Dr. Willie to hear your remembrances of how you came to Morehouse. Now, these tobacco farms were in where, Connecticut? Connecticut. Connecticut, all right. All right. Dr. Willie, how did you decide on Morehouse? I came by accident. <laughs> accident has been very glorious in my life. I lived in Dallas, Texas, and I'd never been, I'd never traveled outside of Dallas, Texas. And my mother was a graduate of Wiley College, and I had two brothers, older than I, who also uh, enrolled in Wiley College. So that was going to be the family uh, college, uh, except I was the squeeze child. I was number three. There were two older than me and two younger than me. Uh, my father was a Pullman porter. Decent salary, but not that much to spare. So I needed a little help by the time the third person came along to go to college. It wasn't a big problem in my family because my older two brothers had been drafted into the armed forces during World War II. Well, I was also a good student in uh, high school. <laughs> I think it's been going down ever since. <laughs> but uh, I was a salutatorium of my class in Wiley College in Marshall, Texas, sent a scholarship to the two black high schools in Dallas uh, for the ranking student in the class. Now the ranking student was a woman and I was the second ranking mm. student and I was a man, uh, salutatorian. Mm. Well, the valedictorian took that scholarship that Wiley sent to Dallas, to the two black high schools in Dallas. I was left without any help. Mm -hmm. I talked with my band director, A.S. Jackson, and also the, he was the director for the uh, chorus, chorus at my high school. And I told him that uh, I need a little help to get to college, and that the, the Wiley scholarship that I was counting on, the valedictorian has taken it. And he said, well, why don't you write to my uh, alma mater? And it so happens that A.S. Jackson who was a brother, uh, whose brother was also a minister, mm -hmm. and he was the uncle of Maynard Jackson, the first mayor of, of this place. He said, so why don't you write to my, my college? I wrote to, off to Morehouse. They didn't know me, and I didn't know them. And the catalogs were sent to me said that Morehouse would give a scholarship to the ranking student in any uh, class throughout the United States. And that's when I started doing a little deductive thinking. I said, if the valedictorian is a woman, and she's already taken <laughs> uh, the scholarship to go to Wiley, and I'm the salutatorium, but Morehouse is a men's school, I must be the ranking student. <laughs> 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 and I, went, I wrote there and used that logic, and they <laughs> gave me the scholarship. Hate to say it, but I lost the scholarship after the first oh year. <laughs> But, you know, I was already here, and <laughs> nothing was going to keep me out there. <laughs> but that was the best uh, thing that ever happened to me. It hap what it has done over the years has enabled me not to see a failure as a failure. Mm -hmm. The failure really put me uh, in, the area, in, in the opportunity to go to Morehouse, which I would not have had otherwise. And since that time, I've been a Morehouse man. Excellent, excellent. Very good. Yeah, we all have those stories about how we decided to come to Morehouse. Uh, uh, now, Dr. Cook um, and Dr. Willie, but beginning with you, Dr. Cook, when you arrived on campus now, when I uh, uh, first arrived here, it was in September of the year uh, 1961. And I assumed that it was around that same time when uh, the class of uh, 48 arrived. Mm -hmm. What were your first impressions when you arrived on campus? I suppose, first of all, had you been to Morehouse before? Had you seen the campus before? If not, then what were your first impressions when you arrived on campus for freshman uh, week, I think we called it, back then? Uh, what were your first impressions when you arrived on campus, and when did you meet Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who was also in that class, arriving for freshman week uh, in 1944? Well, of course, I, I knew uh, a lot of students at Morehouse because of my experience on the tobacco farm in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I felt uh, pretty well at home. 
uh, 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 being here at, at the house. And um, I said, I met Dr. Brazil, so I, you know, I felt all right. In addition to which, I was a um, football player. And though Moaz did not give scholarships in those days, it was uh, very advantageous to be a football player, I thought. And so I became a member of the Fighting Maroon Tiger uh, team, and later became captain uh, uh, of the team. Um, so I, I, so I, felt it, I felt at home. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't far from home, uh, just down in Griffin, just you know, say 40 miles. Uh, Class-wise, that uh, was a challenge. Uh, Griffin, uh, the high school in Griffin, did not go beyond the e 11th grade. Uh, so that's why I got to Mohawk as early as I did. But it was real, the classes were challenging, but they, 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 were, they were exciting. And I got the feeling uh, that the teachers were interested in us as students. They were concerned with us becoming uh, scholars and taking life seriously. And on Tuesday morning, we heard uh, Benjamin Elijah Mays challenging us to soar, not to waste our time, and not to have no aims. So it was a, 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 it was a really uh, exciting place, Moaz was. I always found Moaz exciting. I find it exciting today. I, I, I was here uh, for freshman orientation uh, last August, and it was amazing to see how Morehouse enriched the traditions by adding here and there and so forth. So I felt very much at home. It was a, again, more when exciting. Did you, when did you first? Yeah, uh, well, uh, that's a, a question really in my mind, and uh, I think he and I discussed this a couple of times. My dad was a Baptist preacher, and his dad was a Baptist preacher. And I remember Daddy King delivering the commencement address in Griffin uh, when I was, uh, I, I suppose, in junior high school, mm -hmm. something like that. And I think, though I'm not sure, uh, that Emma was uh, there in Griffin with his dad. Uh, we, we debated that and so forth. Uh, I could have met him at some convention, Baptist convention. And so I'm, I'm not sure. We, we debated. I'm not sure when I met him. But I knew about him, of course, I knew it, uh, about his dad, his family, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know when at Morehouse, yeah. both of us are quite young, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, that we developed a friendship and so forth. I think it's a natural yeah. process, I suppose. The bonding of the class. The bonding. Yeah. Dr. Willie, what about uh, your first impressions of Morehouse? Uh, I don't know in what direction you came in. I came in behind Graves Hall mm -hmm. with the fire escapes. I don't know what was the entrance into the college. But what were your impressions when you? Well, I thought it was a great school with all of these big buildings. And uh, I was excited. I'd never been out of Texas before mm -hmm. to see what was on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And I was exposed to so many different people in the chapel. Mm -hmm. Chapel service was wonderful. Mm -hmm. We got to see all kinds of people that I only read about in, in the newspapers that I, would, I sold while I was in Dallas. So I thought this was the most cosmopolitan place that ever existed. And then we were close to Spelman, which I, I really found to be a wonderful place. <laughs> <laughs> Did that, that have anything to do with the scholarship? Uh? <laughs> well, it may have. You don't have, have to answer that if you don't want to. <laughs> 
Maybe I think I think the major problem with the scholarship was that I was only 16. I, see, I, I see. didn't really know how to study. Uh, but once I got admitted to Morehouse, nothing was going to keep me out. And my family began to be excited about it. But I thought this was an extraordinary place. And the, other, the thing that uh, was so exciting to me, I grew up in the black ghetto in Dallas, Texas. But when I got here, there were students from uh, Ohio, students from California, students from New York, and one or two from Texas, and students from Griffin, Georgia. <laughs> when I, <laughs> I met all of these people. I thought I'm a cosmopolitan yeah. fellow to be at Morehouse to get to rub yeah. against yeah. all of these persons. And then, of course, in those days, the teachers had to invite the freshman class home to dinner. They broke us up. And I, I happened to go to dinner at G at the uh, uh, doctor, oh, the English teacher, who was a wonderful English teacher. Chandler? Chandler, okay. yeah, that's right. And. Uh, uh, that dinner was what really impressed me, too. They brought us to dinner and fed us. And later on, when I was in his class that same year, I wrote the first essay I'd ever written. And the doctor, <laughs> Mr. Chandler wrote, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're not writing what you think. I had a lot of flowery words <laughs> and so on. But the fact that I had been to his house and had dinner enabled me to accept that without feeling put out. Uh, you know, after all, he'd given me food, so he must be interested in me. <laughs> and so I took his, uh, I, I really responded to everyone as positively as I could because I was learning so many new things. Now, unlike uh, Sam, I, was, uh, I wasn't that big, <laughs> and I couldn't play, I wasn't good in athletics. <laughs> so I started playing my trumpet <laughs> in the band, <laughs> And in those days, the band would walk all the way back from uh, the football field, even if we lost by six points. <laughs> we consider that to be great. <laughs> and I also sang in the glee club and so on. And that took me to Spelman yeah, a little more often mm -hmm. because for the, for the uh, Sunday afternoon uh, service, yeah. we all Best had to go over church, there. Yeah. Spelman would not you come until 5.30, but when the evening service was over at 4, I had my jump to call on the girl that somebody else would have called on. And so that, so I was more <laughs> oriented toward the music in those days, and I just wasn't big enough. I'd lo I wished I had been yeah. an athlete, but I yeah. just couldn't, yeah. so I, that's. So it was a yeah. cosmopolitan experience for me I'd never had before. That's wonderful. In a few minutes, I mean, I am going to uh, ask uh, you to talk a little bit about uh, the social climate and culture yeah. and behavior, particularly the uh, uh, social, uh, interaction with the uh, ladies of Spelman and the Morehouse men. But before we go to that, where did you live? Or did both of you live, Dr. Cook? Did you live in, in um, uh, um, Graves Hall? Graves Hall, yes, Graves Hall. Okay. Um, Third floor. Recall that experience. Did Dr. King ever live in Graves Hall? He was from Atlanta, but did he live on campus? Uh, he, I understand he lived on campus one year. Oh, he did, okay. Uh, but I don't remember him on, on campus. Uh, he lived, uh, he was an off-campus student yeah, and yeah. so forth, I and he spent on campus, this guy knows yeah. I want to add okay. one okay. thing, uh, going back to my own experience uh, and, and getting adjusted to Mohawk. Um, at Mohawk, there was a man named Dr. Joy D. Kelsey, uh, who had a PA, who finished Mohawk, got a BD from Andover Newton Theological Seminary, and PhD from Yale. It so happened, that Dr. Kells's parents had headed Cabin Creek School there in Griffin, a private school. Mm -hmm. And my uh, brothers had gone there, my sisters had gone there. And that's where I began school, at Cabin Creek, okay. right, in Griffin, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, had, they just had a warm relationship with the Kelses. And when I got to Morehouse, here was Dr. George D. Kelsey, who influenced Martin Luther King, one of the major influences more out on him. The other was Dr. Mays. Uh, Dr. Kelsey made a brilliant record at Yale. In fact, uh, the dean at Yale said, they don't come much better than George Kelsey. And he kind of took me under his wings. Uh, he was a very rigid man, had a deep voice. 
And when Dr. Kell says, spoke, Dr. Harry Wright Jr., you, the, the, you know, you, you thought that the universe was speaking. And he had that voice, that authority, and so forth. And he took a great interest in me and advised me and this, that, and the other, and so forth. And that made me feel a little at home. And uh, I should never forget uh, his mother was interested uh, when Moak played Tuskegee in Columbus. And I wrote a little note and said, make sure you're there because Moak's are going to win the game. <laughs> <laughs> we lost 19 to 40. <laughs> <laughs> Other professors, Dr. Cook, before we go to you, Dr. Willie, what, what uh, other professors, uh, other than uh, Dr. Mays, did Dr. Mays teach classes at that time, or was he just, a, did he teach any, any religion courses, or was no. he just president? As Lerone Ben said, Dr. Mays didn't teach any classes, but he taught all oh, the classes. <laughs> <laughs> and Chapa was his basic forum. And Every Mohawk man who came through Mohawk at that time remembers chapel. Mm -hmm. It was compulsory. Uh, six days a week, Saturday was the day of grace. And on Sunday, six days a week, we went to chapel. And Pop Dansby, professor of mathematics, we checked, you know, you got, we got all these computers now. <laughs> well, Pop Danby sat in the balcony in Sale Hall Chapel and just looked down his row and checked the row just by looking down on the students and so forth. It's just a, an amazing, uh, uh, you know, amazing uh, phenomenon uh, uh, of that. But uh, it, it's a long story about chapel and the impact it had on us, student participation, student government, this, that, and the other. But the most amazing thing about chapel at Mohawk in those days was on Tuesday, when Dr. Mays himself spoke, when he held forth, and he always carefully prepared. And Dr. Mays was a great motivational speaker of my charisma he had. And he could put the fear of the Lord in you, really. It, he, that's, that's, that's a powerful, that's, that's a powerful speaker. And when Benny May was speaking in chapel, one of my dear friends, an older friend uh, named Bob Sherrod, Dr. Wright knows him in New York. Bob Sherrod said that when Dr. Mays spoke in chapel. Pagans sat in the windows to hear it. <laughs> Pagans said. He just, uh, just, just inspired us. One of my former students who became a judge said he could be flunking in class. He'd come to chapel and hear Dr. Mays challenge us and tell us about the unattainable ideal and the perils of low aim and the divine character of high expectation, the inexhaustible possibility of life. And he said, I would end up with an A in the class. That kind of thing really happened in the chapel. So chapel was very special. And in the chapel context, Benji Elijah Mays was the man. You know, we were always excited about Benji Mays. After he speak, you hear guys say, didn't Benny wax and wave, didn't he? <laughs> Wasn't he great? I mean, that's just, just amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you live in Grace Hall, Dr. Willis? Yes, Do I. you remember Dr. King a little bit more? I think I was on the second floor. Mm -hmm. I don't remember Dr. King yeah. living there either. He may have been, uh, but by the time I knew him, yeah. uh, he was living at home and commuting. And in fact, he did not have a chance to participate in all of the campus activities because of that. We were very political at, <laughs> at Morehouse. Mm. Uh, I never could be 
a student body president because Sam didn't elect to be my <laughs> sponsor. <laughs> And the person he sponsored <laughs> won. <laughs> well, this was, this was a wonderful experience. Yeah. If you ever talk about that kind of competition, it was here. It yeah. wasn't bitter. It was yeah. just, we're going to each us. Yeah. And so Martin Luther King Jr., though, he used to go come in. All of us <laughs> didn't miss Tuesday Chapel. And he would follow Dr. Mays all the way back to the administrative building, yeah. discussing and arguing <laughs> <laughs> some idea with him. And of course, Dr. Mays loved that mm. because he wanted all of us to be thinkers of ourselves. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, that chapel, I agree with uh, my classmate, chapel was a very important point because anybody who was famous who came to Atlanta wanted to speak in chapel. And we got to see a number of people all over the United States who came to chapel. That's why we liked chapel so well. And the boys at those days could tell whether you were a good speaker or a bad speaker. And they were telling the truth. <laughs> they wouldn't stamp their feet and say no, but right afterward, we would take them apart. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was, it was one of, I think, one of the most important experiences Wonderful. at Morehouse. Did you have a fairly close relationship with Dr. Mays? I know Dr. Uh, du Bois Cook. You, uh, Dr. Mays is like your mentor. Am I correct Absolutely. on that? Mm -hmm. uh, what about your uh, relationship? Well, he was Dr. a mentor of well, many well, students. Well, that's true of all of us. Uh, uh, I don't know how he did it because he was a mentor to yeah. all of us. The truth is, I had uh, I I uh, studied for a doctorate degree because of Dr. Mays. Mm. I studied for a master's degree because of Dr. Mays. My major uh, uh, ment mentor was uh, uh, Dr. Chivers. Mm. And um, doctor, when I had finished my studies, I didn't know what to do. And uh, Mr. Chivers decided I need to get a master's degree. <laughs> you remember, I had two children younger than me at home that still had to go to college. And my parents couldn't pay for graduate work. Mm -hmm. So um, Mr. Chivers went to Dr. Mays and convinced him to, to let him have a teaching assistant, because he also ran this mm -hmm. family mm -hmm. uh, clinic, too. And uh, the teaching assistant uh, was, was for me. <laughs> and I had, and what, uh, what they paid me was enough for, for room and board at Atlanta University. I went over to Morehouse, picked up the check, and went over to Atlanta University, paid. That was the little scheme that Dr. Mays, with uh, uh, my major teacher, uh, cooked up so that I could get my my uh, master's degree. Then uh, they decided I should have a doctorate degree. Again, I didn't have any money. <laughs> and so Mr. Chivers again went to Dr. Mays and talked him into giving him enough money to bring the chairman of uh, sociology at Syracuse here to give a lecture. Mm -hmm. Dr. <laughs> my, my, the chairman, chairman of sociology here had met uh, that fellow at the <laughs> national meetings. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mays found the money from some way, but we didn't have regular people coming from outside with the, the lectures, except in chapel. Dr. Mays gave him the money, and he got the man to come to the matter, and I don't know what the speech was about that he gave. <laughs> but before Dr. Mays and uh, Dr. Chivers got through turning, putting a half Nelson on him, he <laughs> said, tell him to make <laughs> to make application to the graduate school and they will accept him. I'll lean on sociology to see if we can get him a scholarship. Now, here's Dr. Mays, all of these students here, but he saw this one student in need, wanted to do something, and he was part of the uh, group to set up a trap where I could get ready to go to Syracuse. It worked because I stayed at Syracuse for 25 years. I was chair of sociology vice president of the place, only because Mr. Chivers and Dr. Mays decided I needed to get a doctorate degree and facilitated my getting it. Dr. Cook, what about you? Um, Ohio State political science. Um, were you a political science major here at Morehouse? Um, and then how did, uh, did Dr. Mays or some of the other professors play a role in your going to graduate school? I'm sure they did. No, uh, 
it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty ironic. I could not major in political science at Moars at that time. As a matter of fact, I got, uh, Dr. Banks came here uh, my um, June, sophomore year and taught. He stayed one year, so I had one course in political science mm -hmm. uh, at Morehouse, mm -hmm. uh, in political science per se. Uh, I had a course under Samuel Woodrow Wilson Williams in political philosophy and um, worked out quite well. Gave me a good background. So when I got to Ohio State, they were using the same textbook, George A. Sabine, a history of political theory, mm -hmm. in the class that I had used at Morehouse. Mm -hmm. And Professor Henry Russell Spencer saw one of my papers and he said, you know, Mr. Cook, this is excellent paper, so this and the other and so forth, and commended me and so all of that. But he didn't know at that time that I had all, I read the book. That's the, thanks to Sam Williams teaching me, uh, you know, what this is. Oh, good. So it gave me a good background uh, when I went to, went to Ohio State to study. But I had to, only uh, I said, one, one course uh, in, in political science per se. Uh, Dr. Um, Brisbane was scheduled to come to um, Morehouse to teach. In fact, Dr. May had announced it. My senior year, so we were all excited. We're going to have a full-time political scientist at Morehouse. And then Dr. Brisbane decided that he wanted better stay at Harvard and finish up his education. So he did not come. And so I didn't get that coat, didn't have to study. I told him I, I would have been outstanding political sciences had I studied under him and so mm -hmm. forth. He's a bad guy. You did quite well. Oh, uh, but he, you know, he, he didn't yeah. waste that. So what, what was your major when hmm? you were at the time? What did you major in? <laughs> I had a combination of philosophy and history. Uh, uh, so I think, I, in the end, I went down as a, well, I know I did, as a history major. See. It's yeah, amazing history. I didn't know that until tonight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was a history major, <laughs> uh, not political science. Uh, I see. So what, I was a history major. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, it's kind of public knowledge that uh, Dr. King, um, while he is perhaps our most celebrated and prominent graduate, and by, by many standards we would agree with that, certainly a member of the great class of 48, which I ad admire. But I heard that when he was at the college, he was just an average student, that he had this brilliant mind. But as a student, he didn't always make the top grades. I heard that he changed his major two or three times. No, he was a sociology until he decided he wanted to be a minister. Okay. It was, took three years before he made that decision. But no, he was very much like the rest of us. Okay. Uh, some, some of our classmates were very smart, and some were very smart, but they didn't reveal it. <laughs> he, was in the he was in the group that didn't reveal, didn't reveal it. it but was yeah, I w I'm glad you raised this, because this will help you understand Dr. King much yeah. better. Yeah, of course. Dr. King had only one A in a class when he graduated from Morehouse. <laughs> that was Dr. Kelson's class. Other than that, he had B's and C's. Mm -hmm. More B's and C's, but they kind of were similar. Had one A, and then he had uh, one D on his record at Mo House. That was a class in French. Now, my wife used to tell me when I was telling that he had a 2.5 average when he left Mo House that I ought to tell on myself. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be in today. She got the flu. Uh, she was coming. But anyway, um, Dr. King was 2.5. That's halfway between B and C. Mm -hmm. But Chuck Willie was 2.8. <laughs> when I'm dishonest, I say that's B minus. <laughs> when I'm honest, I say that's C plus. <laughs> and yet, all of us did well. Yeah. Because we were good scholars. Yeah. We read and we debated with people. Uh, 
I think part of the, the, the grades were we were very young. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Dr. King had only one A <laughs> his first year. I mean, the whole time he was at Morales, but he had only one D. So most like me, I had one D. Yeah. I don't know how many A's and B's I had and C's I had. Mm. This also was during the time when we used to talk about the gentleman C. Mm. So you weren't uh, cast aside if you did that. Nevertheless, we all were interested in challenging the people who came to lecture to us, challenging our teachers. If our teachers were not teaching us well, we would get together and two of us would just ping pong back and forth until the teacher would say, yes, I, I may have been wrong. And <laughs> we were terrible in terms of <laughs> working with teachers. We didn't want to hurt them, but we just wanted them to be straight. Yeah. And if they didn't know what was there, tell us that. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, King was part of that yeah. kind of situation. Yeah. Uh, he, 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 I just, uh, there was a nice article in, in Ebony in 1988, Sam gave a little blurb about it. I did, and Robert Johnson <laughs> used to be with Jet Magazine. Horace Ward was, I said something, Pickens, Dr. <laughs> Pickens. We were all talking about Martin Luther King, Jr., and it's quite clear that he was a great scholar. Mm -hmm. He did uh, take his classes mm -hmm. seriously, but we were very young, mm -hmm. and also, they were very strict markers at Morehouse those days. <laughs> so no great inflation back yeah. then. It's an interesting thing. I and I would really be interested in Sam's idea. Well, he he, he was a better class person than I was <laughs> in terms yeah, of yeah. thing. But I how is it we got the reputation of not having high grades, but at the same time were really involved with the issues of the day? and could tell whether another person was telling the truth or whether mm -hmm. it was just fooling around. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things I've never been able to understand about Mohaus, mm -hmm. but that's what they did for us. Mm -hmm. During my, f my four years um, at Mohaus, only one student made all A's, and they made that for one year. That was Noah Wills. Yeah. His freshman year made all A's in four years. Uh, kind of tough. Sam, how many A's grade. did you have? But how many A's? Did you <laughs> I played the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing about it is, uh, and we're jockling like we are here, mm -hmm. all of us knew that we were serious. Yeah. And our teachers knew we were serious. And that's why I have been against the concept of talking about closing the gap. We had wide gaps, but we knew a lot. And that's what we were learning from Morehouse, and that's one of the issues I've taken on as I've dealt with school integration and so on. Don't tell me you want to close the gap because what I do better than you do, you may need. And what you do better than I do, I may need. So why do you need to close the gap? You want to have diversity with people who know a lot about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And that's what was going on at Morehouse at that time. And that was the kind of Morehouse that that uh, uh, my King saw, but one more footnote to that. While King's uh, time at Morehouse was like mine in terms of the uh, grade point average, <laughs> he went to graduate school immediately after Sam and I did too. We didn't get worried, we went. <laughs> if the opportunity was there, we went. And at uh, uh, Crozier Theological Seminary, his third year there were all A's. He was valedictorian. <laughs> Are there, yet only 2.5 average at Mohouse. I want you to remember that, because although you may not have high grades, that doesn't mean you're not going to lead after you lead if you take Mohouse seriously. Um, don't hold me to that stool set in class. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to ask I you what you're <laughs> 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 um, Dr. Mays in the 1940s, he came in 1940s, you well know him for the decade of the 40s the decade that the class of 48 was here, he made it a point to make sure that uh, the student, the quality of the students recruited from us were excellent, and obviously they were. Grades don't always reflect mm -hmm. the cerebral, the That's right. depth of what we know. I won't talk about my grades anymore. I <laughs> didn't make any Ds, but I did make some Cs. <laughs> uh, um, 
He also wanted to improve the faculty. Uh, the number of the members of the faculty who had PhDs um, uh, dramatically increased in the first 10 years of his uh, 27 years at the helm of Morehouse College. Um, what about the social life at Morris in those days? Uh, as I said uh, earlier, the um, contact with Spellman, the rules, the regulations, the restrictions, or the lack thereof. What about the community at large? Did you go into the community for uh, social outlets, uh, for dining, for movies? Uh, what about, what did students at Morehouse do in the 1940s when you were here, Dr. Cook, uh, socially? Well, let's see now. Go ahead and spell one. <laughs> we could go to Spelman for one hour, visit him for one hour. I think three days a week. One hour. One hour. From <laughs> four thirty to five thirty or something like that. Just, just, just one hour. <laughs> that was it. And when that hour was up, <laughs> you know, that was you were gone. gone. <laughs> you, you were gone, you know, and, and, and so forth. As I uh, had dances uh, that were over, as I recall, about uh, 10 o'clock from 8 to 10, something like that, and had them in the uh, old gym uh, here, here on campus. And the chaperone were pretty, pretty strict and so forth. And uh, when I was a student by the president, uh, some of us got together and, and said, so said, let's make sure that the chaperone are having a good time. The chaperone are having a good time and that uh, that they are never standing there, you know, without a dancing party. <laughs> so we organized. So that all the chaperone would have a good time. <laughs> 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 and instead of the dance ending, at 10 o'clock, it ended about uh, almost midnight. <laughs> yeah, so far. And we got away with it. At least I thought we were <laughs> I guess 15 years later, when I was on the faculty at Atlanta University, associate professor, came up for uh, promotion to full professor, uh, Miss Reed, who was the president uh, emeritus of Spelman at the time, uh, got up and opposed my promotion. <laughs> and uh, she said, on what grounds? Guys, academic, he's done all the things, this, that, and the other. And she said, when he was a student by the president of the old house, he did this, that, and the other, and so forth. So when she said that, so Benny May hit the ceiling. <laughs> I mean, he was president. And Daddy King, uh, said to me, asked me, he said that when Dr. May finished, he said, I, he said, I had my shotgun. <laughs> and then, you know, you know, Daddy King was, had a great sense of humor. Oh, yes, he did. Right. And I want to make another point, though, that happened during this time con in connection with what Sam talked about. Uh, when I was a senior and Lerone Bennett was the president, I was president of the senior class and Lerone Bennett was president of the junior class. And the dean at Spelman, uh, had sent down a notice that the, uh, the, the, the junior senior prom could be attended only by uh, persons who were enrolled in Mohouse and Sipelman. Well, this was in 1948. Many of our students <coughs> had come back from the armed forces. Some were even married, and some were older, so they were dating people within the city rather than going to Spelman. And uh, Lerone and I got together and decided that that wasn't good. That wasn't what Mohouse stood for. Uh, so we decided to write a letter to Spellman back to the dean and say that uh, that's not fair. 
And uh, for we, Mohouse will not participate in any junior senior prom, any dance that has that name to it, as long as there are restrictions on who, who can come. We sent the letter, we made some, uh, some errors in it, and we nailed it up by the, we used to stand in line to get into, go to the place where you chow, to ch <laughs> and somebody read it and saw the, uh, the errors, so we went down and grabbed the letter out of the mail, <laughs> came back and cleaned that up, and then we sent it over to the dean. And that was a pretty strong letter, and what we were doing was re we were reflecting the whole concept of fairness that we were taught at the Morehouse. Well, I was up in Dr. May's office one time, short, shortly after, and we never went to Dr. May's office alone because we thought if we'd take two or three people, we could then argue with him. <laughs> but one, you couldn't argue with that well. He looked out the door and saw me and said, Mr. Willie, could you come in here, please? <laughs> Lord, I didn't have Sam with me. I didn't have Bob with me. I didn't have Bennett with me. And I was sure he was going to ream me out for the writing this back to a fellow administrator at Spelman without coming through him. I thought that's what he was going to do. What he did is close his door and said, a lot of flowery language in that, Mr. Willie. 50 day, years from the day, they won't know what you're concerned about. You should have said, number one, number two, number three. <laughs> that was the most wonderful experience I've ever had. Instead of him saying, you should have come through the channels, yeah. what we were doing was right. We said everybody should be able to come to the prom if they're invited, no matter who they are. And he was telling me how I should have written it better. Yeah. That's when I realized I was really at the right school at, when I came to Morehouse. Yeah. Well, it, it's quite clear that under Dr. Mays, as I, I'm sure under our, uh, his successors, that Morehouse was about producing men. Yeah. Mental quality, and certainly we can see that in what you have said and what you have said too, uh, Dr. Cook. Um, another question about Dr. King, and yeah. then we're going to ask about the Moas mystique, and, and then we're going to allow for some questions from the audience, and we'll wrap up. Um, was Dr. King involved in student activities when he was here? What, what did he do? What kind of student was he? Was he just on campus for classes, engaging Dr. Mays in dialogue? Or did he also immerse himself in student life? Yeah, I, I did a little research on that to see what some of the other persons who were at Morehouse at the same time said. And they all came to the agreement that because he was a city student, mm -hmm. he didn't have a chance to get involved in the politics of the campus that well. Uh, this doesn't mean that he wasn't deeply involved in a number of things. And we had a local NAACP chapter, and he was you know, connected with that. There were a few white and schools as well as the Morehouse Spelman and Atlanta University mm -hmm. who had a, 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 a little group of integration, a little interracial inter mm -hmm. uh, group, and he was, he was part of that. Mm -hmm. And so he was part of the whole campus, but he wasn't part of the political aspects mm -hmm. of the campus because mm -hmm. he wasn't there to run for office mm -hmm. after, after dinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, deeply involved and mm -hmm. deeply involved in all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in that respect, he didn't have the same experience that Sam and I had okay. who were on campus. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was quite clear by all of the classmates who answered, who, who, who gave that statement in mm -hmm. this 1988 uh, uh, article in Ebony. Uh, everyone said he was a great orator. <laughs> uh, one said he was... Uh, and he was quite interested in, in uh, what was happening, the great issues of the, uh, and, and he, uh, so he was good in that, those respects and was here often, mm -hmm. but in terms of just the regular yeah. politics mm -hmm. of, of Morehouse, mm -hmm. he was not able to get in that as much because he was not there at night. I first had a job at YMCA across town right after, uh, for the evening. Uh, that was to get a little more money to go to school. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for people who came swimming over there, I was in the room where they had to put their clothes. And I kept that job for a week or two, and I realized I didn't have a chance to, <laughs> to sit around and talk with the boys after dinner, mm -hmm. and I quit. <laughs> I, I needed the money, but somehow I stopped that because I realized that was taking me off the campus mm -hmm. too long. 
Um, go ahead. <coughs> this one's uh, this. Uh, some of you have read this, uh, the autobiography of Martin Luther King by himself, edited by, of course, Dr. Clayton Carson, who's on the faculty at uh, Morehouse uh, here. But it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, book. He talked about um, how he got involved in social issues, how he read Henry David Thoreau's uh, mm -hmm. Civil Disobedience several times, and how he got the vision that uh, if it's right to obey a good law, uh, then it's to be wrong to obey a bad law. Mm -hmm. And this got him caught up in these things. Uh, he, he, he said that he, he was concerned uh, with a social issue, learned it at home and this and the other and so forth. And uh, he, um, wrestle with issues of the intellectual respectability, religion. He got involved in any organization at Morehouse, he said. He was concerned with social justice and equality. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the basic one was civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. he, he got involved mm -hmm. in, in, in that situation. Now, was that the exception? Were other students like that? Was that kind of like what Mohawk's men were doing then, or was he the exception? Was he uh, kind of apart from the rest in his uh, embrace of civil disobedience? No, I think, it's a, it's other I think overall we, we were concerned. One of the, one of the uh, great things that Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> says in this book, <laughs> he, said, he said, at Mohawk's, the first time I was in an environment where we were free to discuss any issue the race issue, any kind of issue, and that Boaz provided the, the background for this kind of discourse and helped him to grow up and, uh, you know, and mature and so forth. And he, he paid Mohaz a tremendous uh, uh, tribute, uh, so much so that uh, I'm, I'm this guy who read this, what Martin Luther King Jr. said. It's a paragraph. Because mm -hmm. a tremendous tribute to what? My days in college were very exciting ones. There was a free atmosphere at Morehouse. And it was there that I had my first frank discussion on race. Mm -hmm. The professors were not caught up in the clutches of state funds and could teach what they wanted with academic freedom. They encouraged us in a positive quest for a solution to racial ills. I realized that nobody there was afraid. Important people came in to discuss the race problem rationally, rationally with us. It goes on. I could discuss it. Uh, the book was called uh, Crusader Without Violence. L.D. Reddick uh, at one time was the li uh, librarian at the, for the whole system. Uh, and here he says, uh, he says, Martin Luther King Jr. described the teachers at Morehouse as scholars who encouraged their students to explore and search for solutions to campus and world problems. Reddick's follow-up description stated that Nobody on the faculty seemed to be afraid to think and speak out. He attributed this largely to the example set by President Mays. That was the, it's kind of it's similar to what you, you said, Sam. It's, uh, there was not any fear here. And that's what Morehouse did to us. They may not have taught us how to make A's all of the time, but they taught us how not to compromise when there's injustice. Okay. And that was true for King as well as the rest of us. And I, th I still think today that, that uh, permeates the campus, and, yeah. and we have a number of students who are socially conscious and, yeah. and aware and are involved. And uh, I think that's one of the linkages to, to my years and, mm -hmm. and to your years, and your years too, Dr. Cook, when you were here. Before we open up for one or two uh, questions, and then we will ask uh, Dr. Crawford to come back and close out the program for the evening, which I think has been very enriching. I've learned some things that I didn't know. As you well know, we're going to be rewriting the history of the college uh, to celebrate our 150th anniversary 
in 2017, and some of the information that I have uh, garnered tonight, gleaned tonight, I will um, uh, enhance and amplify and use that. But the last point we want each of the uh, uh, Mohas men to make is, how would you, in a very brief way, I know we can go on uh, and, and talk about the Mohas mystique for, for some time. I think some have written about the black college experience and yeah. Dr. Dr. Mm -hmm. Willie. Uh, Dr. Cook, how would you define this Morehouse mystique that we all kind of symbolically wrap our, our minds and our arms around? The Morehouse mystique. What is it? As you have come to understand it. Well, I would define it roughly as uh, the paradox of, of the union of pride and humility. And by pride, I mean a self-confidence, a certain character, and so forth. I don't mean hubris, mm -hmm. as theologian would say, as Dr. Carr would say over there. I don't mean uh, self-vanity, self-love, mm -hmm. arrogance, pretension. Uh, that's not what the, the, the pride that Mohas is about. Um, it's, it's not about arrogance. It's not about insufferability. You know, I, I've seen uh, some Moaz men uh, uh, who thought they called themselves Moaz men were just insufferable with their arrogance. You know, no one had the sense but them that somehow had a monopoly of wisdom, truth, and virtue. And everyone else had nothing but ignorance. That's anti mohawk So I said this, it's, it's the paradox of pride and humility. But by pride, I do not mean hubris, self-love, arrogance, self-pretension. When the Montgomery officials discovered that violence could not stay the protest, or stop the boycott in 1956, they resorted to mass arrests using an old state law against boycotts. Dr. King, who was in Nashville at the time, uh, <coughs> stopped by uh, Atlanta on his way back to Montgomery uh, to see his family. His father, frantic for his son's safety, because all of the people who had been involved in the uh, boycott were being arrested. He assembled a group of friends to consult with him and his son about the wisdom of Martin Luther Jr. immediately returning to Montgomery. It was on February 22, 1956, that the elder black leaders in Atlanta assembled at the residence of Martin Luther King Sr., according to Martin Luther King Jr in his own book, Died Toward Freedom. And let me close this out with one more paragraph. Uh, <coughs> Reverend King said the reason for calling his, his son and the black leaders together, he expressed his opinion that his son should not return to Montgomery right away. In Stride Toward Freedom, Martin Luther King Jr. writes that after his father stated there were, after his father's statement, there were murmurs of agreement in the room. Then he said, I listened as sympathetically and objectively as I could, while two of the men gave their reasons for concurring. These were my elders, leaders among my people. Their words commanded respect. Some, soon, however, I could not restrain myself any longer. And I said, this is King, I must go back to Montgomery. My friends and associates are being arrested. It would be the height of cowardice for me to stay away. I would rather be in jail 10 years than desert my people now. I have begun the struggle and I can't turn back. I have reached the point of no return. In the moment of silence that followed, King said, I heard my father break into tears. I looked at Dr. Mays, 
one of the great influences in my life. Perhaps he heard my unspoken plea. At any rate, he was soon defending my position strongly. Mm. And this is what May said. I had to defend Martin's position. Here was a man of deep integrity and firm convictions. How could he have decided otherwise than to return to Montgomery? How could he hide while his comrades in nonviolent arms were being carried to jail? That, in essence, was what I said. And then later, Dr. Mays, and this will be the end, later Dr. Mays said, I am mighty glad that I had the wisdom to give young Martin Luther King, Jr., the moral support he needed at that time. I had admired him ever since he entered Moore House as a freshman. Now my respect for him mounted on wings. I read this to you because I want you to know that Daddy King was on the board of trustees of Moore House. And here he was supporting Martin Luther King Jr. against the reason that the father had called the elders together to counsel him not to go back to Montgomery. And that's the kind of person Ma uh, Mays was, but that's the kind of person Martin Luther King Jr. was having come through this situation. So I hope if you get nothing else out of this is that you ought to make good grades, but if you can't, still be a leader. Yeah. <laughs> You've got something to do. And this is what we are here about today. Excellent. Let us give our brothers a hand. I think we're going to have an opportunity for perhaps two questions. Oh, good afternoon. Just one quick question. Sorry for the, the, the delay, but it was actually burning inside. In the course that we took last semester on King and the Modern Struggle for Freedom, we looked through the papers of his writings and some of the correspondence, and we see that there was an underlying theme throughout all of them. And we see that King dedicated his life with service and sacrifice. And it seems like I read the book by Dr. Cook. And it seems like that was the message that Dr. Mays was giving to the class at that time around 48. But my question to the two panelists this uh, evening is we're living in the 21st century where greed has taken over America, not even just America, but now it's actually in the church now. And so we're living in the age of the prosperity gospel. So if Dr. Mays was alive today, what do you think he would have to say to the class of 2012, which was my class, in reference to responding to the issues that's going on in America in reference to materialism and greed. I'd like to say greed has been going on for a long time. It's not new. Uh, but if you would ask, what do you think Dr. Mays or other faculty members would say, I think they would do say what they told us. They told us to go out there in the world and defeat it, <laughs> but defeat it in a loving way. That's how I got to Harvard. I tell people now I own Harvard. <laughs> I'm not there because I'm happy because they hired me. I've been there a third of a century trying to make it do what they taught me to do here at Morehouse. So you're going to run into different kinds of problems at different stages in life. They may not be the problems that we talked about here. They may be different problems. But the one thing you have to remember is the whole concept of love and justice. Love is making a, an appropriate uh, understanding and definition of another person's need or another group's need. And then <coughs> uh, uh, justice is the way that's implemented. And I think you need to learn how to be loving and just uh, no matter what age it is, no matter what year it is. So from that point of view, the strategy you use may be different, but the goals that lead your activity should be similar to what we've been talking about today. 